Prophet of Thought. The Prophet of Thought series. Open, open your, your mind. why you're here and tonight tonight i got a special show for y'all tonight because tonight we have the one and only prince of pan-africanism dr umar johnson is in the house live and direct it's gonna be a good show for y'all tonight got some donations last week so i want to thank my donors Last week, y'all know I always thank y'all and y'all know who y'all are because I know a lot of y'all, y'all don't like me to mention y'all names. Um, but I want to thank you because if you're watching, I want you to know that I appreciate um, your generous contributions. And um, you know who you are because every time you send me a donation, I always write you a personal email, not a computer generated email. I sit down, and write you a personal email. So I just want to thank you for uh, the donations last week. It is greatly appreciated and keep them coming. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, tonight, tonight, y'all, um, this has been a long time coming. Those of you who've been following the Proper Thought Series for a while, y'all know that I in that I interviewed uh, Dr. Johnson about three years back and uh, taped one of his seminars. And y'all know the doc is very compelling and um, it's going to be a good show tonight. And also we got a call in. We got the old TPOT phone lines up tonight, something we don't do that often. But tonight um, we are going to be doing it. Um, if you look right there um, on the screen right here, you'll see. The phone number 712-775-4010. That's seven. No, actually 712-770-4010. I gotta change that. Sorry about that, y'all. <laughs> but um, the number is 712-770-4010-775 is all the number. My bad, y'all. I'm gonna fix it in a few minutes. But without further ado, the doc is in what's good dr johnson peace and love all as well joining you from philadelphia uh just had my first class of the first annual course of pan-african nationalism leadership training colloquium still hunting for the frederick douglas marcus garvey academy and uh, i'm just getting ready to head back on over to london england and birmingham england and i'll be over in i believe that's the gambia for the first time speaking a lot of speaking going on, but definitely, without question, building the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is foremost on the agenda. Also, allow me to let your listening audience know that we are beginning the uh, interviews, the uh, videography for my first documentary, the shockumentary, the psychoacademic holocaust against black boys, the special ed and ADHD hustle. So if any of your listeners, and I'm sure they are, if they are in the five-state area of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, I repeat, if you are in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, and you have a testimonial to give, something you experienced with your son or daughter, in the arena of education or mental health, they were misdiagnosed, medicated, left back, 
uh, they were kept against their will in a mental health hospital. Any testimonial you have, we are beginning to shoot the interviews for my first ever documentary, Shockumentary, The Psychoacademic War Against Black Children. The first documentary is going to focus on the five-state area of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. So I'm asking if any of your listeners are in the five-state area of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, and if they have a testimonial or know of a parent who has a testimonial, something that their child went through, son or daughter, that was racist, unfair, excessive, and may have caused permanent damage to their child whether it was chemically, psychologically, or otherwise. So we're dealing with misdiagnosis. We're dealing with police brutality. We're dealing with psychiatric medication. We're dealing with miseducation, every aspect of miseducation and every aspect of mental health. If any parents have a testimonial and they're willing to tell their story on camera, I'm asking them to text message me at this time, 215-989-9858. Again, 215-989-9858. They should send their name, their city, their state, and the word shockumentary so I know the text message is in reference to the interview for the documentary. We're going to tell the truth of the school-to-prison pipeline, the psychoacademic holocaust, like it's never been told before. Okay. Okay. Um, Good 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 doc. You said you you were were willing to answer some questions, right? Sure. Uh, Uh, If y'all have any questions that y'all want to shoot, at the Absolutely. doctor, uh, um, please shoot, shoot, shoot them on out there. This, they, this, also, this is their opportunity. Yeah, this yeah, is their opportunity. Also, also, you can you can, uh, you can call, call in. You can seven one two seven seven zero four zero one zero. All right, seven one two seven seven zero four zero one zero. Access code eight eight nine two one two. We get echo and feedback out there. How about, How about now? I hear a little bit of it. It's not bad. It's not excessive, but I do hear some. You were supposed to look at uh, FDMG today, right? Yes, sir. Potential campus today that I was going to inspect uh, school, rather, uh, but the weather kind of uh, interfered with that because I wouldn't have been able to see everything in its dry state so you can really tell what's leaking and what's not. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so I just got to reschedule that. No big deal there. But I had started to say earlier that we should have had a school at least um, a year ago, at least. There were several schools that we could afford but once the owners found out that I was the interested party, uh, interestingly, something always happened to the school. Either they decided that they no longer wanted to sell it or they found out that the archdiocese didn't approve them to sell it. Just a bunch of nonsense to keep me mm-hmm. from uh, buying the school. That's been going on for about two years, so we should have been in the school, you know, uh, but for reasons beyond our control due to racism, and other things, we didn't get one. Um, so, so, so we're still pushing. But, but the school search experience reaffirmed for me something I've already known because I've taught it for years, and that is white folks are more concerned with power than money because mm-hmm. you've got schools that are just sitting around the country that I've tried to buy, and they mm-hmm. would rather not make any money. They would rather allow the school to continue to, to deteriorate than to let Dr. Umar Johnson put his vision into play. 
So they chose the power over the money, and that's something I try to get black people to understand because a lot of our people have this erroneous belief, this fallacy that white people care about money more than power. Nothing could be further from the truth. First is genetic survival, then it's power, then it's money. And the school search experience has proved just that, that they would rather not get paid. They would rather let the school sit. They would rather not sell it at all than to give me an opportunity to see my vision succeed. Wow. And do you run into to that a lot, Dr. Johnson? Like, have you have you ran into that multiple times where, like, a, an academy was available, but you ran into this, you know, this prejudice and bigotry and all this other kind of nonsense? Has that stagnated you before? Oh, without question. Uh, there was about the Archdiocese of Detroit had about five schools that we could afford. And they told me that they're not selling me no school unless they see my curriculum. And I told them my curriculum is none of their business. This is a real estate transaction, and that's all it is. What I'm teaching, how I'm teaching is none of your business. And so they said unless I showed them the school plan, they would not sell the school. And you know, as I know, that had I showed them the school plan, they really wasn't going to sell the school. So it wasn't no need to show them that. Um, so that was wow. Detroit. That's about five schools in Detroit. There was a school in Mount Vernon, New York, same situation, where um, that was a lease. That was a lease, uh, but they still refused to lease it to me. Um, so that was another school. That's about six. One in Trenton, New Jersey, that was seven. One in Philadelphia, that was eight. Uh, there was one in New Jersey. They pulled back on me. That was nine. Uh, we probably had about a dozen schools now that I should have had and didn't get simply because I am who I am. Do you think that is is it a possibility that your your rep is, your uh, your rep you know your reputation has preceded you and they're like they would sell they would sell the school to someone else but not sell it to Doctor Umar per se. Oh, of course, of course, because I think the way that they see it is if they sell me that school, all the other white boys are going to want to find out which white boy gave him a school. Mm. You follow me? So it's like I don't want to be the one. This is what they're saying to themselves. I don't want to be the one who gets crucified in the white community for selling Dr. Umar Johnson to school. Wow. You know, that, that, that's really what the situation is. It ain't going to be me to do it. They're not going to come down on me for that. Because they know my school is going to be significant. It's going to play a significant role in the black struggle, and they don't want to be the one who gets that credit, or should I say discredit, from their own people, get discredited from their own people for being the one who sold Dr. Umar's school. But with that being said, though, with that being said, um, there's two schools that I'm looking at now where – it appears likely that we'll be able to get one of them. Mm. So, you know, I'm still very hopeful and optimistic in this, and I feel that before the year is out, we're going to have this school. Um, you know, not to say so much on it, but there's one in particular that I think may happen, and then there's another one that I think very strongly could happen. Now, if you say, what is the school that you want the most? The school that I want the most is sitting up in Detroit, Michigan, owned by black folks. But I can't get it because they want too much money and they don't want to lease. And that's the situation. You know, there's a school up there that I really like, ideal, owned by black folks. But they're more concerned about the money than the mission. So, you know, they want like $1.4 million for it. We, 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 we only have half of that. At 750k, so that's the that's where I would be. I would be in Detroit right now if I had it my way. Um, but again, we don't we don't have the money that they're asking for. You know, who knows? Maybe they'll call me today or tomorrow and say, "Give me what you got. Take the keys." You know, but um, if it was up to me, that's where we would be. So let me let me ask this: If do you do you believe that? It may be the fact that you're trying to start the school in America 
as opposed to maybe trying to start it in, you know, the continent of Africa or South America or something like that. Do you think you would get as much resistance, you know, as far as the school is concerned, you know, if you were like somewhere else, like on another continent or, you know, do you think you would get more resistance? Do you, you know, would the resistance be the same? It would be easier to get it started in a place that is ran by a black government, yes, it would be easier. But it would still have difficulties because in Africa, for example, although I think it would be easier to acquire the property, I think on the governmental level there could be some challenges there because, you know, most African governments around the world are still controlled by European powers. And so with the white man considering me a threat, I think that he would force some of those officials to make things difficult for me in terms of the operating of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yes, it would be easier elsewhere. The reason why I, I have investigated putting it elsewhere, you know, the Caribbean islands, other places like that, one of the difficulties is finding people locally who will help you uh, by doing the necessary groundwork to gather the information necessary so you can purchase the property, you know, and operate your school. You know, mm -hmm. there's not enough people who are willing to do the groundwork. And that's even in the States. There's not enough people willing to do the groundwork. So that's part of the reason why it hasn't happened somewhere else. And then the other part of that, too, is the fact that most of our donors were American African parents. And to me, it would be somewhat unfair to take monies largely raised by American African parents and take it to Africa where many of them may not feel comfortable sending their child to study. So I'm, you know, being loyal to those who raise the money. And, of course, we receive funds from all over the world. You know, I have a very large international following being a Pan-Africanist, but yet and still the bulk of the donations came from right here in the United States. And so I feel obligated to put that first school in the United States. Can y'all hear the doctor now? Press one, if y'all can hear him. Test, test, one, two, one, two, one, two. Dr. Umar Johnson, the Prince of Pan-Africanism, International Ifa Tunde, King Kong Consciousness. Can y'all hear me, family? Can y'all hear? Put one in the chat if you can hear him. Press two if you can't. Yep, they can hear you now, doctor. All right. I'm trying to give y'all some more volume, if I can, so y'all can hear the good doc. If you got any questions that you want to ask him, they better be intelligent questions, because if not, what I'm going to do is have my moderators bounce you up out of here. Y'all know how we do it here at TPOT. So uh, guess what? You say something stupid, you're gone. Moderators, y'all know the deal. Anybody ask something crazy or say something out of line and disrespect our guests, y'all know what to do. Put them down. All right? So y'all can type questions in the chat or, or you can um, go ahead and call the phone number if you want. Up to you. Well, while I got you here, Doc, let me go ahead and I just go ahead and shoot some questions at you. Um, now you know that people are people are wondering. I know because I got a lot of these questions when everybody knew you were coming on. When when everybody knew you was coming on, it was like, oh, are you going to ask him uh, about the money? Are you going to ask him about this? Are you going to ask him about that? I said, no, I'm not asking him any of that crap. Um, what I want to know is, is after, what I want to know is after, once the school, you bought it and you have it and it's straight, um, what what happens then? What happens then? Once you've bought it, you've secured the property, you've secured, you know, the building and all that, what happens after that, doctor? Well, then we begin the business and the work and the process of liberating the African mind one child at a time. So then we actually have to begin the re-engineering process, the psychological and intellectual re-engineering process of our people by way of the children 
Uh, Frederick Douglass, my ancestor, he said it best, that it's better to raise strong children than to repair broken men. And that is the central model of the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy. We're going to create revolution in the mind so that the child can then create revolution in the world. And so once we have that first one up and we perfected that model, we're then going to franchise it. We're going to replicate that thing all over the world. You know, the first school will be the most difficult one. It will be the most difficult one because once we get the first one up, the rest of them will be easy because now people have seen it. They have felt it. They have heard it. You know, they have seen the results of it by way of the children. So it will be easy to replicate it once, you know, it gets up. They always say your first business is the toughest. Once you get it up, there's nothing to franchise and to replicate it around the world. So we're looking forward to that. But more importantly, I don't want people to lose sight of the fact that although the school is extremely important, critically important, substantially important to what we need to be doing as a people, I don't want folks to lose sight of the fact that the school is just the foundation of a 21st century black Wall Street that we hope to create in the immediate community surrounding that school. So wherever it's going to be, the school will just be one cornerstone of that Black Wall Street because then we got to build that hospital. We need that supermarket. We need that bank. We need that farm. You know, so, you know, the school is important, but that's not the only thing we're striving for. We're striving to build independent black communities black producers, black manufacturers, black distributors. That's what we're looking to do to fulfill the vision of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. That's the end goal. We begin with education, but we don't stop with education. Well, let me ask you something that I've often asked, you know, other professionals and psychologists. What do you think is the biggest problem that, that affects black society today? What do you think the biggest problem is? It is love, fear, and feeling inferior to white folks. That's the number one problem. We love them, we fear them, and we feel inferior to them. And the irony of that is the only energy, the only entity, the only being in the universe that one is supposed to fear love and feel inferior to is supreme consciousness, the one almighty sovereign ruler of the universe. That is the only being we should fear. We should feel fear, love, and inferiority, but instead we feel it for the white man, which is why I always say that as long as African people are psychologically incarcerated, the white man is our God. The white man is our God until we liberate the intellect and the souls of black folks the white man will forever be our God. That's why the white Jesus is still the most popular picture in the black community. That's why you can still find homes. And I know this for a fact because as a traveling child therapist who do therapy in children's homes, I see it all the time, the white Jesus is still in the black household to this day, 400 years later, and he's still up because the white man is, in fact, our God. That white Jesus is just a symbol of a much larger, a much larger belief that we have in the white man as being sovereign and being indestructible and being unconquerable. Every attribute of God, black people subconsciously see that when they look at the white man. That's why you hear black people say, we can never get out of our problems. Why can't we never solve our problems? Because the white man is his God, and he sees the white man as invincible. And he wants to be as much like the white man as he possibly can. So he wants to live in his neighborhood. He wants to marry his daughter. He wants to talk like him, act like him, walk like him, eat like him. White man get a dog, he wants a dog. You know, whatever they do, we want to do it. Because he is, in fact, what so many of us strive to be. That's why Barack Obama was so popular. The reason Barack Obama was so popular, although he did nothing for black people, nothing whatsoever, black people. He remained extremely popular because he got white folks to accept him. And that is the ultimate goal for black America, to be accepted by our oppressors. 
Now, it's not the ultimate goal of Chinese Americans. Chinese Americans trying to build a political economic power base for Chinese, Chinese people. That ain't the goal for Arabs and East Indians. It ain't the goal for Latinos and Mexicans. It ain't the goal for European Jews. Their goal is to build a political economic power base for their people living in this country. But black folks, we are the only non-white people in America who ain't interested in power, ain't interested in wealth. We are interested in being accepted by white folks. And that's why Barack Obama is so important to the black psyche because he has re-energized us, although erroneously, into believing that we might have a chance of getting white people to accept us. We got a question in the chat from somebody named Conscious Vegan. Vegan, what's the deadline for the school, they're asking? There is no deadline. There is no deadline. The school is on divine time. I don't have a deadline. Uh, the school will come when the school comes. It's like asking what's the deadline on black redemption? What's the deadline on African independence? What's the deadline on eliminating post-traumatic slavery disease? What's the deadline on getting black men to stop dating, sleeping, and marrying white girls? There is no deadline. It'll come when we achieve the goal. I don't have a deadline. I'm on divine time. But personally, though, personally, I would like to acquire the school before the new year because that will still give me almost nine months to prepare for the opening day, which I would like to be August the 21st of 2019, as that will be the quadricentennial of the beginning of African slavery in the North American colonies, August the 21st of 1619 to August the 21st of 2019, 400 years. So I would very much love for the school to open on that date. And if we get to school by New Year's Day, we can still achieve that goal. You said earlier that you were you were taking his resumes for people, I guess, who want to work for the school, who want to work at the school. Um, is there any particular is Are there any particular applicants that you're looking for, particularly? Like, is there any special, you know, special abilities or special? Uh, I don't know, special degrees that people have to have to come work for the school. Not necessarily. We're going to be an independent school. And the state where we ultimately wound up dictates what the requirements are in order to teach at an independent school. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, you can be a certified independent school teacher if you have a bachelor's degree and at least 18 credits in the subject you're going to teach at the school. That's the requirement in Pennsylvania. It may be different elsewhere. So the state where the school ultimately wounds up is going to dictate the criteria that folks would need to have fulfilled in order to be licensed to teach in that state as an independent school teacher. Um, but of course, we're required to have math. We're required to have science. We're required to have language arts, social studies. So needless to say, we need those teachers. But for my school model, so much of what we're going to teach the children is unregulated by the Department of Education. So for example, I want sisters who know how to do natural hair because for those boys who have natural hair, blow out, twist these locks, I want to teach them scientifically how to do that type of hair. And then when we extend the school to girls, because ultimately we will extend it to girls, although we're starting with the boys, we're going to need sisters who can do natural hair care. We need horticulturalists. We need gardeners. We need farmers, zoologists, biologists, people who can make clothing, shoes, fishers, African martial arts. I mean, everything under the sun, documentary filmmaking, every possible trade and specialty and craft that you can possibly know. We want to give as much of that to our children as possible. So even though it will be a grade school, it will pretty much be a university because almost everything under the universe will be taught under that roof. And so that's why I'm telling people, don't look at yourself as a licensed educator because that's going to limit your scope. The question 
I tell people they should ask themselves in determining whether or not they should, should submit a resume is whether you have something to offer our children. That's the question. The question is not, am I a licensed teacher? Because you're limiting yourself. You may have something to offer that does not require you to be licensed. If you got a, if you got a, a, a brother, you know, who is an expert in robotics and he's not a licensed teacher, he can still come and teach robotics at my school because I'm going to let him do that. So again, it's not about being a teacher or not, who's an educator or not. It's about what do you have to offer our children? That's the question. I got a whole bunch of sisters and brothers who know how to sew clothing, make clothing, tell their clothing. They're going to teach that. They're not certified or licensed as a teacher, and they don't have to be because that particular skill is not regulated. And so if it's not regulated, then we're able to practice in that area as we see fit. And for those who are interested, they can send their resumes to FDMG, resumes with an S, FDMG, resumes at gmail.com. We only ask that they not be married to, dating, or cohabiting with an alien. Can't break my school, can't be loyal to black men, black women. That's the only relationship we respect. And they cannot be sexually confused. We don't want that type of energy in our academy. Wow. Now, do you think that people are going to, do you think that people are going to, I don't know, because you because you talk about the natural hair and you know the sexy confuse and and that kind of stuff do you think that people are going to are they going to try to make hay over it because you you enforce these regulations on the academy they could but they won't get too far because the school is totally independent finance you see, you run into a lot of those issues when you're taking money from the government. That's when you run into those issues. We're totally independent. Every penny is the pennies of black folk, freely given for the purposes of educating our children. So although we would have to be careful with the things we say and pronounce and declare and require, you know, but at the same time, people need to understand that the rules that govern public entities do not govern us because we won't be a public entity. We will be a private school independent community. So there's things that we can require that a public school can never require because they're publicly funded. And as such, they cannot discriminate in any way, shape, or form. Wow. So are you are you gonna be on site, Dr. Johnson? Like, I mean, are you absolutely every absolutely. every day? Full time? Sir, as much as possible, full time. Full time, which is why I've been telling people over the past year or so that my public speaking days are numbered. Uh, there will never be a time when I'm not public, publicly speaking, because I think oratory has a long and storied history in our culture. So there will never be a time when I do not orate. But at the level I've been doing it over the past 10 years, at the rate I've been doing it globally, there's no way I can see to the proper education of our children and continue to travel and speak the way that I've done. The speaking will almost be terminated. Uh, there will still be some, I will still accept major things. I will still go to different countries. I will still do my regular tours to England and Canada, the Caribbean islands, and Africa and Asia, you know, but nowhere nearly as much as I, as I travel these past eight years. I've literally been on an eight-year speaking tour, literally, because there hasn't been much breaks in these eight years, and I've enjoyed it. I mean, I've seen the world. I've met a lot of people. I've changed a lot of minds. But once FDMG opens, a lot of that is going to stop. Wow. Well, we got a couple questions in the chat. Um... Dan's world is asking the question about the possibility of opening the school in Africa. Um, they said they missed the answer due to my technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there will be a school in Africa without question. I am a Pan-Africanist and I am a Garveyite. 
second to none. And without question, Africa is the goal. And there will be plenty of FDMGs in Africa. But the first one will be in the United States out of respect for the donors, most of whom come from the United States. And I owe it to those parents who donated, hoping that their sons will get a chance to go to the school right here. And so I feel obligated to put that first school in the United States. And I believe the second one will be in, in, in Africa. Hmm. Well, Trink, Trink163 wants to know why you had negative words for what LeBron did. Uh, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> because I didn't have any negative words for LeBron. I was in Africa uh, the first week of August when the news broke that LeBron James had opened up a school. In fact, I was sailing down the Nile River in Kemet, headed to Nubia, when my phone started blowing up with all these screenshots and messages from people saying LeBron has a school before Dr. Umar, yada, yada, yada. The typical uh, nonsense that takes place whenever something happens that my detractors feel they can use to try to uh, discredit my ambitions. And what I said when I got back to the United States, when I was asked about it, I said, well, number one, I support LeBron James mostly. Uh, he could do more, but I appreciate the fact that he's already done more and spoken up more on issues relevant to black folks than I, Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan combined. Oh my God. So I'm a LeBron fan, uh, but I did need to co clarify that LeBron James did not open up a school. LeBron James does not own a school, nor did he open up a school. The school that's being called the LeBron James School is a Akron City Public School. Let me say that again. It is a Akron Public School. Private citizens do not own public schools. Public schools are owned by the state. LeBron James did not open up a school. That was a lie. LeBron James provided incentives, primarily free college, for the children and parents of those enrolled in that Akron City public school. And so he said that if they attended that school, he would pay for them and their parents to go to college which I think is a good thing. I have nothing to say against that, but it's not his school. LeBron James does not finance the school. 75% of the money comes from the state because it is a public school. Taxpayers are paying for that school, not LeBron James. He doesn't choose the teachers. Most of the teachers in the school are white women. Okay. I have too much respect for LeBron James to even think he would open up a school for black boys and put all white girls in charge of it. Okay, he doesn't control the curriculum. He doesn't control the hiring and firing. It's not his. It's no different than if Will Smith came to Overbrook High School, his alma mater, in West Philly and said, hey, anybody who graduates from Overbrook, I'm paying for them to go to college. He gave an incentive. And Will Smith has done those kinds of things at Overbrook. But does Will Smith own the Overbrook, a public high school? No, he don't. Does he hire the teachers? No, he doesn't. Does he create the curriculum? No, he doesn't. So LeBron doesn't have a school. He simply provided some incentives to an already existing Akron public school owned by the state of Ohio, not LeBron James. So I simply clarified that. But in no way was that intended to take away from LeBron. I actually like LeBron. Hmm. I hope that answered your question. Um, you can keep the questions coming because I'm just going to kick it with the doc as long as he's on here um so i know you have a lot of speaking engagements coming up doctor uh when you get when you're getting down back to our area down in the south man when you're going to be back down here doc well it's interesting that i'm on the show today because i got a, a sister reached out to me today who said that her organization was interested in bringing me to charlotte um i hadn't spoken in charlotte since 2015, mm -hmm. February. So it's been almost four years. Uh, February 2019 to be four years. So it's been a while. I was supposed to be at Johnson C. Smith this past February until some of the homosexuals and reactionary Negroes 
uh, sent a fabricated voice tape of mine to the local news in Charlotte, and they said that I was telling people to kill police. And they sent that to the president of Johnson C. Smith University, and he promptly disinvited me from the university. Um, so that's what spoiled that visit. Um, I mean, I can tell you the homosexuals and white girl lovers, they are always doing whatever they can to discredit my work. But again, the young lady is looking at bringing me there, her and her organization. She's supposed to be getting back to me tomorrow, and we will see. But I'm overdue for Charlotte. Yeah, man. I did a lot of love from Charlotte. I used to live in North Carolina, um, and I'm overdue for Charlotte. Atlanta gets me all the time, and I just feel like I've been kind of, you know, mistreating Charlotte, but it's not my fault. It's just difficult to find a venue mm. down there to make things happen, but now we have an organization working on bringing you back. So will you be, um, will you be, sp well, you're not, I guess you're not going to go back to JCSU, right? You're not going to be speaking there, right? Are they trying to get no, you back there? Back. They're not going to let me come in. No, they, they won't let me come. Black colleges are very scared of white folks because that's where they get their money from. <laughs> a white college would have a before a black college would because of their fear of white folks. Wow. Uh, we got another question from the chat room. Dan's World wants to know, is there a possibility that you can create an online donation campaign to reach the fundraising goal sooner, perhaps through Kickstarter or Indiegogo? Well, we had Go Soon, which was operating fine. The problem was the LBGTs and the white girl lovers and the reactionary Negroes uh, constantly wrote letters to the GoFundMe administration telling them that I was stealing the money. I had no intention of opening a school. The whole thing was a lie, a fraud. And when white people constantly get this type of misinformation from your own people, it makes it very easy for them to dismiss your campaign because they never believed in it anyway. So, the re so my GoFundMe was shut down because of the constant complaints of Negroes, none of whom donated to the school. So it wasn't even their money. And that's the most ironic thing about this whole school uh, experience. The people complaining about the money haven't donated the dime. My donors are very much behind me, very much in support of me. They send me support mail in Texas every day, all day. They're not the ones complaining, and it's their money. The people complaining are people who haven't given a penny. Um, but I will say this, though. I was never really a fan of the online donation platforms because they take too much of your money. Like, we give and go for me over $150,000. That's the price we pay for convenience of online donating. What's wrong with going to the mailbox and dropping off a check or a money order? What's wrong with that? Because we, we don't we can afford one hundred and fifty thousand dollars just for the convenience of donating online, which is why when we started the fundraising in twenty fourteen, I didn't even set up a GoFundMe until twenty fifteen. It took a year or more because I didn't want to give them none of our money. So for folks who are interested in donating, they still can. All they have to do is make out a check of money or they're payable to FDMG Academy and mail it to P.O. Box 6872 Philadelphia, Pennsylvania 19132. And if they didn't get that, they can just text me for that information. 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. Someone's asking double exposure expose y'all i'm sorry we need to said we need to support the postal service anyway and dan's world is asking what about through paypal well paypal you gotta watch this because the initial fundraiser was paypal paypal was the first platform and then once we hit a hundred thousand dollars paypal said well we can't keep on letting you donate you know unless we start seeing some paperwork and you got to have your not-for-profit, and we didn't have the not-for-profit yet. You know what I mean? So we went from PayPal to GoFundMe, you see. And so once the school is up and running, we'll be able to reactivate the PayPal. But, you know, again, they still take a piece out of that. You know, they still take a piece out of that. Go PayPal is still going to charge you the 2.5. Now, I do think they have an option where if it's a donation, they will not touch it. 
But in order for them to treat it like a donation, you got to have your not-for-profit status, which we don't have as yet. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this, uh, doctor. I know that you want primarily um, black donors. Would you be willing to take money from from others like Hispanics, Asians, whites? Would you would you Absolutely take their money? Not. Well, well, Hispanic is not a race. So okay. if it's an Afro Latino, Afro Cuban, Afro Rican, Afro Boricuas, if they want to donate, they can because they belong to the race too. Okay. But if they're not African, we don't want their money. As the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said, this is a black man's movement. And it will survive off black man's money. I don't want their money. This, when that school get open, it must be a victory for us. It cannot be a victory for multiculturalists. It cannot be a victory for LBGTs. And I can't, it can't be a victory for the United States government or the Rockefellers or any other white philanthropic organization. When that school opens, I need to be able to say, and you need to be able to say, and everybody needs to be able to say at the grand opening, we built this and we built it by ourselves. We need to be able to say that there's a spiritual, there's a spiritual principle to being able to say we did it because black people ain't used to building nothing on their own no more. Every time we do something, we got somebody else involved. Every time we do something, we got somebody else involved. Where are the all black institutions at? We hardly got any. NAACP, not all black. Urban League, not all black. We got our black fraternities and sororities, but they got white folks running all through them. Where is the all black institutions? FDMG might be the first all black institution of the 21st century. Wow. Well, exactly. Double exposure. I believe that he said, what's for us is to be done by us. I agree exactly. totally. Self-determination? How can we talk about self-determination and self-reliance and then say, I'm going to go get this grant from the government? In other words, I'm going to take money from the same people I'm claiming I'm trying to get free from. Isn't that a contradiction? Exactly. I'm trying to get free from you, but I'm going to beg you for some of your money. That's ridiculous. The revolution will not be financed by the oppressor. The revolution will not be financed by the oppressor. Let me say it one more time. The revolution will not be financed by the oppressor. And guess what? I would argue one of the reasons why black folks haven't made more progress since 1968, Dr. King assassination, and 65 Voting Rights Act, is the fact that we keep on relying on the oppressor's money to make progressive movements. Nearly every black organization you can name is getting money from somewhere other than black folks. The hand that pays is the hand that rules. The whole purpose of why the Rockefellers set up the not-for-profit corporations was to finance the people they oppressing. Because they figured out that if you give poor people money, they so worried about getting some money that they're not even paying attention to who they're getting the money from. Wow. Half the people giving out free money to black folks is the major organizations and institutions oppressing black folks. Look at Bill Gates. All the money he's giving out through his scholarships and stuff. And he the main one in Africa spreading disease, calling it immunizations. Look at all the death and destruction the Rockefeller Foundation has put across the world to black folks. And they the main ones giving out grants. Did you know Spelman University is named after Rockefeller's wife? Spelman was Rockefeller's wife. You got a black college named after the wife of one of the most racist imperialists in world history. You know why? Because we'll take anybody's money. We don't even pay attention to who the hell's giving it to us. Well, we got another question. What are your top three desired schools, desired school locations? It's a two-part question. And how much more money do you need to purchase the property? Um, well, as we I think we answered that earlier when we said that we could have already had a property. Uh, so money isn't the primary issue. It's the second issue. The primary issue is getting these racist school owners to stop trying to pull back 
on selling the school once they find out it's me. That's the number one issue. And the reason that's number one is because we could have had a school by now had that not happened. So the money ain't primary because this school is going to cut with the money we got. So the money ain't the primary issue at this point. It's racism. Money is the secondary issue because if we had more of it, then we could get a better building. If we had more of it, I would be able to get the school up in Detroit that I really want. So money is the second issue. It's not primary because we can't get a school with the money we got. It's just that racism is keeping them from selling the building to me. Uh, but ideally, another 750 grand, 1.5 million would, would take me to a whole nother level in terms of uh, purchasing schools. We could get a really nice building for that amount of money. But again, money ain't the issue at this point. Racism first, money second. So if... Oh, and, and location. Go ahead, I don't have an ideal location. Dr. Umar is loved all over the world, loved all over the country. So, you know, I just want where the school to be to be a primary black area. Yeah. You know, but it could be Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, Baltimore, D.C., you know, Raleigh, Durham. It could be Houston. You know, it could be Tulsa. It could be Milwaukee. It doesn't matter where. I don't, I'm not married to any. I'm a Pan African. So I can be anywhere. That, that's really not the issue. It's about the building, not the base. You know, oh. it's about the building. So, there's a, for example, there's a school in Cleveland that just came to my awareness yesterday. So, I'm going to go check out the school in Cleveland because it looks like it's in pretty good condition. So, and I get, I have a very strong following in Cleveland. So, it doesn't matter where. I mean, I really love everywhere I go because I get love everywhere I go. So, I'm not married to any geographical location. Yeah, because that was going to be my question. You know, you do want it in a primarily black area. But I got an, I got another question coming from the chat from Samira Johnson. She says, hi, Doc. Will you be coming back to the UK this year? And also, what are your thoughts on the Nike uh, Kaepernick deal? As far as the UK, I will be in Birmingham, England, October the 27th. And I will be in London, England, November 3rd. So I'll be over there for a week. Birmingham, October the 27th. And London, November the 3rd. And if she needs the flyer, she can uh, add me on WhatsApp. But she's international. So add me on WhatsApp. Any of your international listeners, add me on WhatsApp. Same number, 215-989-9858. Or send me an email. So for email Johnson at yahoo.com. And I'll send her that flyer. I mean, we strong following in the UK. Um, and I'm looking forward to coming back over there. We moved to Baruka. We was just there a couple months ago, sold out as always. And uh, we're looking forward to coming on back. So UK, I love it over there. You know, that's, 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 that's a very strong Dr. Umar. Country. Oh, and it's here to Colin, Colin Kaepernick and Nike. Nike, that was a very shrewd, Machiavellian business. That was genius for Nike to do that. And I'm going to tell you why. Nike don't give a damn about Colin Kaepernick or the pro. But what Nike did, the reason they did that was they wanted to exploit the Colin Kaepernick pro-black okay, uh, sports base. The people who want sports that are pro-black Colin Kaepernick folks because by doing that, they just created a whole new market for themselves. So now Nike has a whole new black power market for their merchandise. Remember, over the spring, they came out with the, with the Marcus Garvey Air Force One. Red, black, and green high up top, Air Force One, Marcus Garvey. Now, of course, the animal Marcus Garvey probably turned over in his grave 50 times when he saw that. But Nike just came out with the Marcus Garvey Air Force One, RBG on the top, white gold. So they know there's a whole market of black conscious folks who are protesting the NFL. So they said, how can we tap into all of those millions of black conscious folks so they can start buying our merchandise? So that wasn't about supporting capital. That was about opening up a new market of people who will buy Nike merchandise. That's all that was. And guess what? Even if they change their mind, even if Nike Trump into canceling the sponsorship of Colin Kaepernick, 
it doesn't even matter. The mere fact that they did it automatically opened them up to a whole new market of customers. So that was a Machiavellian business. That had nothing to do with their power. They had everything to do with making money. So he's being used somewhat. Oh, yes, yes, he's being used. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. But I will say this, though. I will say this. A part of me understands why he did it. Because if you got a brother who needs to make a living, fellow athletes aren't forcing the league to take him back because they're cowards. And you got a black community that's not fighting for him to get back in. That brother has to make a living. I don't know if he has children, a wife, I don't know what he has, but he got to eat. And if, you know, accepting a Nike sponsorship, knowing it's nothing but exploitation, if that's the only way he can eat, then he got to eat. And I don't consider that selling out. It's no different than when Muhammad Ali got stripped of the world heavyweight boxing crown and he started doing commercials for fast food restaurants. Was that selling out? No, it was not. He had to eat. And the black community has a very horrible history of calling people sellouts after they have abandoned them. Okay, you call them a sellout when they had a choice in the matter that allowed them to still earn their livelihood so they wouldn't be homeless on the street. But you don't abandon a freedom fighter and then when they accept some sort of a contract from an exploitative European country so they can eat food and wear clothes and have heat in the house, we want to turn around and call them sellout after we abandon them. So I do not consider Colin Kaepernick a sellout no more than I didn't consider Muhammad Ali a sellout because he was selling burgers because it was the only way he could feed his family. Wow. Do you, let me ask you this, Doc, the whole Kaepernick thing, and I'm not, I'm not going to stay on this too long, but do you think that the the whole Kaepernick thing, do you think it was effective because you have other you have other black players in the league now that are doing it now that he's gone? Do you think it was effective and and what do you, what do you think the end game is finally going to be as far as the whole taking a knee protest, you know, thing in a whole? I think it was effective. Without question it forced the conversation. Colin Kaepernick's protest forced the conversation on police genocide into the mainstream public world. It was marginal. They kept it hush hush. They suppressed it as much as they could. They couldn't hide the riots. But once the riots was over, it was business as usual. But Colin Kaepernick, being an NFL superstar and doing what he did, he made the conversation mainstream. By him doing that, that conversation started taking place in other countries, other at other platforms. News media shows was on the he forced them the front page of Newsweek and Time, and that's what he did. He made it an everyday conversation. He forced people to talk about it. So without question, it was significant. The problem was he was not supported by his fellow black athletes. They sold him out and they sold us out. I was absolutely disappointed and disgusted by the way Jalen Rose, how he turned his back on him, the way Shaquille O'Neal, Deion Sanders, who is my favorite NFL defensive player of all time, and of course, Randall Cunningham, my first, Deion Sanders got up there and cooned and said he needs to apologize, and Mike Vick, who I ran into at the Atlanta airport a couple weeks ago, said he needed to cut his hair, and Ray Lewis, cooned out of decades, you know, the excuses he made. You know, it just bothered me to see athletes who I like get up there and put on a damn minstrel show for white folks and try to make Colin Kaepernick look like he's the problem instead of focusing on the real problem, which was the Legion of Thought. I lost so much respect for black athletes, and it only showed, though, the good thing about it, although it wasn't good, the good thing about it was it was a perfect opportunity to show our children how athletes and entertainers are the new coons in America. It was a perfect teachable moment. Perfect teachable moment. Because we have been under this idea that athletes and entertainers are somehow the representatives of black culture. No, they're not. What, 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 look at the rappers. What were they doing? The rappers wasn't doing nothing. They didn't protest nothing. Yeah, they might said a little something, but they didn't do nothing. 
the rappers are just as much coons as the athletes are. Little Wayne talking about uh, he never experienced racism. Straight up coon. So we got to recognize that the black, the new black bourgeoisie is the rappers and the athletes. And you know why they're the new? Why are the rappers and the athletes, the entertainers and athletes, the new black bourgeoisie? Because up until now, the black bourgeoisie was the black professionals. If it went from the black professionals, the doctors and the lawyers and the engineers, then it went from them to the athletes and entertainers. And the reason it went from them to the athletes and entertainers is because the black middle class is a dying breed. We are losing the black middle class. We don't have as many lawyers as a percentage as before. We don't have as many doctors as a percentage as we had before. We don't have as many psychologists and engineers as a percentage as we had before. Because college is no longer the guarantee of a black middle class lifestyle. And so because the black middle class is dying, and now we are going into an era of where you have haves and have not. That's it. See, the middle class was the buffer between the haves and the have not. But the middle class is done. You either have or you have not. And because there's no longer a, a, a definable black middle class, the rappers and athletes have now been pushed into that role of being the coons for the power structure. Wow. I never, I never would have seen that coming where the, the rappers and entertainers and current football and basketball and past former football and basketball players would, would turn on a fellow, a fellow athlete who's actually standing up for something and standing up for people where they would just turn their backs on him and be like, you know, he need to apologize, you know, to the white power structure because he's standing up for something by taking a knee. I never thought I would hear that come out of black folks' mouth. So that kind of took me for back too. Um, you know why? It's because they knew that the larger black people would let them get away with it. Because they knew the larger black community thinks and feels the same way that they do. See, those eight Obama years sold America back to the Negro. Those eight Obama years endeared racist America back to the black man and woman. So with black people feeling more American than ever because the coon of their community was put in the White House to do nothing but implement white supremacy, by the way. To do nothing but implement white supremacy that endeared white folks and black folks. And so they were feeling offensive about Colin Kaepernick taking the knee. Because, see, when you're American, which is why I hate that African American nomenclature, when you're American, it's about the best interest of the country. It ain't about the best interest of black folks, it ain't about Trayvon justice. It ain't about justice for Michael Brown. It ain't about justice for Little John Sandra Bland, Orlando Cassidy, or Alton Sterling, or Walter Scott. It ain't about justice for them. It's about what's in the best interest of America. And the best interest of America is to always stand for this gospel. To always to always act like racism is not. You see, so that's why we hear black people saying that I'm an American. Whenever I hear Nick Ray tell me he's an American, I know that's a king and a traitor. Anytime a Negro tells me I'm an American and I ain't left nothing in Africa, that's a sign for me to get as far away from him as I possibly can. Because <laughs> any black man or woman living in this America claiming it and saying it tries to be, do you know that you say that you are an American and you're proud of it and this is your country? You are claiming in everything that this country has ever been about. You are claiming the slavery and you're upholding it. You're claiming the Jim Crow, the black code, the lynching, the castration, the miseducation, the police genocide. If this is your country and your problem, you proud of everything this country has done to you and your ancestors. 
there is no way in hell you can claim to be loyal to black folks and be proud to be an American at the same time. Well, you know, I'm on media and I, I often I often hear this from brothers and sisters that a lot of the problems that we have within black society, we often hear it. We often hear it told that the problems that we have are American problems, not uh, black problems specifically. Do you agree with that? That's the biggest lie. Let's look at wealth. White folks own 75% more wealth than black folks. They own all the banks, all the hospitals, all the natural resources, all the investment firms. So if it's not a black and white person, why is wealth painted black? Excuse me, why is wealth painted white and poverty painted black? Let's go to education. Black children, even when you can trace the income, even when you control the talent profession, black boys have the worst academic outcomes in this country. White boys don't come close to the region. Black teenagers don't even come close. How do you explain it? If it ain't black and white, why is it still black and white? Why are all the teachers white? Most, and the kids struggling the most black. No matter how you look at it, any industry you go to, it is absolutely clear that apartheid is the ruling government in the United States of America. The problem black folks got, white folks ain't got. White folks ain't got no police brutality problem. White kids are being shot. They care about police on a regular basis. And then Negroes will say, well, you're always talking about special and white people in special. You're always talking about mass incarceration, white people in jail. You're always talking about ADHD, white kids diagnosed with it. You're always talking about single black women, and you got white women in single too. is we are overrepresented amongst the populations that suffer. There's white men in jail, but you keep begin to compare the amount of black men in jail compared to the amount of black men in jail. It's not that white men have the same problems. It's that nobody suffers from those problems in the disproportionate manner that we that's the Well, I believe that black people have gotten better at dealing with it. I mean, that's I say that all the time. I don't think it has gotten better. I think we've just gotten better at dealing with it. Um, but as far as we've gotten better at ignoring it, the whole challenge is just a big The only reason why I still have a race war in this country and who means am I advocating one? Because we ain't prepared for that either. But the only reason why you don't have the type of racial conflicts you had in the twenties with the racial conflicts you had in the forties, the long hot summers and the way hot summers and the conflicts you had in the 60s, those conflicts took place because black folks did not accept their place. Let me say that one more time. Let me say that one more time. The conflicts of the 20s and the 40s and the 60s, the reason you do not have them now is because black folks have learned to accept their place. Back then, you could not force us to accept a second class citizenship. We were not accepted. We fought back. Now we just accept it. After Colin Kaepernick took that beat, if this would have been the 60s, every athlete would have took that beat. There would have been no Chill O'Neills and Chill Roses and Stephen A. Smiths and Ray Lewis's and Deion Sanders on TV blaming the victim and not speaking up for the issue that the, that, that the, that the protesters 
was out to the Trump trust and bring attention to. They could have never done. They would have never done that if this was the truth, because they knew they would have got exposed by the community. They, we would have parades in the post. We would have told them to after somebody. We would have their faces on the church calling them crooks. But that was a different mindset back then. And right now, black folks are very submissive, very dominated. White folks have psychologically dominated. We are at a point of psychological domination. For the first time, we are at a point of psychological domination. White folks are thoroughly dominated. And they know it. They own the Negro. They own it. Do you realize you don't have one organization? You don't have a single black mainstream that is totally 100% that name you Every organization is championing somebody else. Can't name one that's not. Every organization. They either champion the Native Americans, they champion the Latinos, they champion the Asians, they champion the Indians, they champion the white women, they champion LGBT. Who the hell is looking off a black woman? Who has black as their full exclusive name being organization? None of them. Everybody has black women. Even the revolutionaries, you look at their band, they got uh, Geronimo up there and Native American up there. I ain't interested in them, I'm interested in see. Who's looking off a black folk home looking out of the world? We're off an unapologetically out of the world. The race from the world. All your fraternities are surrounded by all of them. Your black mason. Congressional Black Caucus, most black culture. NAACP, Urban League, most black culture. All your black churches, most black culture. Black politicians, most black culture. Who the hell has black as their sole exclusive focus? Very few. Most of us are afraid to walk into the room and say, I represent black people and I represent black people only. I wish all the school. I'm not opposed to such group. And if you wish, I'll give you wrong. I'll push the land for us for a long time. I'll push the land for a long time. I'll push the land for a long time. But my time, I'll give you a long time. 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 I'll give you a I could care less. That's the mindset we need, and we ain't got it. Everywhere I go, there's some niggas crying about how we just can't be about black folks. And that's amazing, because Jews are only about Jews. That's amazing. Chinese are only about Chinese. That's amazing. LGBT are only about LGBT. It's amazing how every Jew in America can be only and exclusively for its well, I've heard it say, I've heard it say, someone's told me this many a times that we as black folks, we are born coons and we don't, we don't, uh, we don't stop being coons until we grow and learn and get educated and have exposure to other things. What's, what's your take on that? Socialized to be a coon. And guess what? We're going to keep on having a coon community as long as black kids go to public school. Do you realize we take black boys and girls and we give them the white folks? Because that's who run the public schools, the white folks. We take black kids and we give them the white folks for 18 years. That's their whole damn childhood. You can give your child an entire youth to the enemy to groom them and indoctrinate and condition and socialize. And then you wonder why you got the problems. How in the hell you expect somebody to be loyal to you when they say in that pledge of allegiance 180 days a year for 12 years? They sing in no songs. They worship in no theaters. And most of all, they got a benevolent wild woman at the front of the world, psychologically disarming against racism every single day of the school. The job of the public school teacher is two. Number one, teach the black.
black kids and white folks are the greatest thing on earth and you should aspire to be like them as much as you can. Number two, white people are in control and there's nothing you can do about it. Get, fit, get in where you fit in. And number three, psychological disarming of the children. They psychologically, in other words, they take away any militaristic, progressive, revolutionary passion that black children may have to want to fight themselves. Because you got a white woman who's responsible for your education. How in the hell can white folks be racist? A white woman taught me. See, this is how they get us. Because they're always involved in giving Negroes handouts. They never give you a hand up. They just give you a hand out. And education is one of those handouts that white folks give. And so when you go to preschool, you got a white teacher, you got a white teacher all through 12 grade. How can you have a problem with white folks when they've been teaching you your whole life? The job of public school is to psychologically disarm black kids away from seeing white folks as their enemy. That's the goal of public school. So, what's what's your take on homeschooling, Doctor? What what do you think about homeschooling? Homeschooling is a good band aid. It's not a solution. And the reason it's not a solution because everybody can't do it. Number one, you got single parents out here. How they going homeschool and work? So it's not a solution. It's a band aid. And even if every parent could homeschool, it's still a band aid. Why is it a band aid? Because the purpose of education is to socialize children and work together for the benefit of the race. The purpose of education is to socialize children so that they can work together for the benefit of African liberation. We hate each other. Black people hate each other. We have no unity. We have no shared vision, and we have no collective consciousness. So how is homeschooling a million different black kids under a million different black rules? How is that going to help our central problem with disunity? It doesn't. Homeschooling does not forge collective consciousness. Homeschooling does not forge shared vision. Homeschooling does not socialize our kids to work together. How the hell are they going to be socialized to work together when they're all in different houses, learning on a computer, or being taught by their parents? It's a good band-aid. I support homeschooling. But it does not replace comprehensive, systematic, institutionalized, revolutionary learning. It does not. It doesn't even come close to doing what we're supposed to be doing. Wow. So let's let's get back to the uh, to the uh, FDMG Academy. Um, the academy is it going to take children? Uh, what's what's going to be the the youngest age of someone who can go to the to FDMG? What's the starting the age? Final analysis. Final analysis, not the first analysis, but in the final analysis, the program will take our children from birth to business owners. Now if we will go from daycare all the way up to junior college. Wow. But in the first analysis, the grades will be contingent on the school we get, the amount of classrooms in it, and the building capacity that it can hold. So you know, if you get a 500 student building, we might start first to eighth. We get a 300 student building, we're probably going to start third to fifth. So the real estate is going to dictate your operational program. You know, if you got a school with a large yard, you can put your agriculture in right away. If you got a school with no yard, that agriculture might have to wait a little bit. You know, so everything is contingent upon the facility. Facilities dictate everything when it comes to education. Wow. It's um it's it's really good to talk to you, Doc. I mean, because you know how I've defended you for for years. I've I've defended you, I've defended your message, I've defended uh I've defended a lot of stuff. Now, mind you. I've 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 doubted you at times. I'm gonna go ahead and give you full disclosure. I've doubted you, but I've always defended defended you within my doubt. Um and I've always yeah, believed Huh? I appreciate the tip, but I don't mind the doubt. 
I don't mind the doubting is I have a responsibility to so improve. You know, so when people question the school, the question is, I don't get upset. Why well, don't get upset? Because I know my school coming. If you knew that you were going to win the race and everybody doubted you, but you knew you were going to win, you don't get upset because you say, as soon as it's over, they will all see why I didn't pay them no mind. It's the same thing with FDMG. I know victory is imminent. So whether it's one person or a million people hating and this and that, and he stole and he, he robbed, and it don't matter because I know the school will be here. And I know everyone who popped off will have to swallow their work. But more importantly than that, they won't even be allowed in my school. And I want to be clear about that. Every coon and Negro and whole pepper that hated on this mission, I'm asking the people who support Dr. Umar, including yourself, when the time comes, let me know who those persons are. And when you show up to the grand open, and when you show up to different events held at the school, when you see a hater, pull me to the side, pull one of my security to the side and say, yo, that brother right there had a lot of very disrespectful things to say about the doc and or the school program so he can be escorted out. I'll be damned. If I'm going to let people who try to destroy something for our baby when they themselves were not working to do anything, I'll be damned if I'm going to let them come amongst us and act like they didn't do no harm when they tried to prevent this from taking place. Knowing full well that most of the personalities in the black conscious community aren't doing a damn thing to impact the reality for our children. They ain't doing nothing. You can't name me someone else in the conscious community who is building an institution for our babies right now. They're not doing nothing but talking, hustling documentaries, hustling lectures, hustling debates, hustling cultural products. They ain't building nothing for our people. None of them. I'm the only game in town building for our children. So if anything, the, the, the condemnation and criticism should be at the hustlers. But they're not going to question the hustlers. They're going to question the workers. They're going to question the one who actually got the credential. And I don't mind it, my brother, because it comes with the territory. But when the school comes, I humbly ask all my supporters, point out some haters. Please help me keep the negative out of the school. They're going to all join the bandwagon. They're going to try to act like they never hate it. I know what they're going to do. They're going to try to act like they never hate it. But I need y'all to let me know who they are because they cannot partake in the celebration because you don't play with something as important as a school for our boys. When you look at the educational outcomes in this country, only one out of every four black boys graduating. And I'm trying to do something about that. And you hate on it because of jealousy and envy. All these black boys being locked up killing each other, unemployed, special educated, medicated, and you hate on somebody trying to do something about it because he raised three quarters of a million dollars and you couldn't. And by the way, most of my haters have a personal stake in this because they've done their fundraisers and they didn't raise as much money as I had. So they the jealous because the people only gave them a couple hundred or a couple stop and they want to know why this man got 750k and we didn't that's because i got a track record of doing the work if you notice every beef i've ever had in the conscious community i've always asked the other person one question do you have a grassroots resume you can show the people every beef i ever had where is your grassroots resume? What have you ever done for our people for free in these streets? And guess what? The beef ends right there. The beef ends right there. Because they ain't got no damn grassroots resume. They come amongst you to get paid off of you. They ain't never done nothing for free. But I got stripes in this hood. I got stripes in every hood. If I told every parent who I ever helped, 
every brother I ever saved, every brother I got out of prison or stopped from going into jail. If I asked them all to come under one roof, you probably need 20 Coliseums. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that we got to stop putting everybody in the same box just because they give speeches or got a radio show or got a Facebook page or YouTube page. We are not all in the same box. You don't put workers with entertainers. You don't put revolutionaries with people who just want to give opinions. I am a worker, not just an online personality. So again, I don't want to go on no tangent. I'm just saying that when the school will be here, and for those who supported me and those who donated, you will definitely be given your just due on that day. Well, you know, often, and, and we run into this a lot, I mean, even in even when we're not someone uh, of, you know, of your caliber and notoriety and stuff like that, just normal, everyday black folks, I mean, when you're doing something, you know, because I'm a business owner, okay, I, I own a business, and I run into this stuff too. I mean, why why do you think it's so it's so rough like it, to be a black person in black society and actually try to do something and you run into all these walls of negativity and often you run into more walls of negativity from people who look like you than you do white folks. Why do you think that is? Well, white folks taught us to do that. Number one, we need to keep something in mind. The entire black community was engineered to work against its own best interests. That's how the slave regime was set up. It rewarded, it rewarded betrayal. It rewarded failure. It rewarded backwardsness. You could get out of slavery by snitching on the revolutionary. Do you realize in some colonies that's the only way you could get free? The only way you could get free was to expose someone who was trying to run away or plot a slave revolt. So they created the whole community to work against its own best interests. So we are still in that mindset of working against our own best interests automatically because it is learned behavior, my brother. It is learned behavior. And on top of that, you got to keep something else in mind. Black folks don't want to see you doing better. Not only because of jealousy and envy and crabs in the barrel, that's a part of it. But the other reason why they don't want to see you doing better is because you have now proven to them that they can do better. And the last thing a lazy Negro wants to see is someone showing him he ain't got to be where he is. See, with knowledge comes responsibility. And that's why a lot of black people don't want the knowledge. I'm not talking about knowledge at the pyramids and the kings and queens, and that's important. I ain't talking about knowledge that we built the solar system and tracked it. No, 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 I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about the knowledge that you can survive despite a, a white supremacy. The knowledge that if we unite, we can still win despite the odds against us. Black folks don't want to be told that. You want to know why? Because they don't want any responsibility for solving the race problem. They don't want nothing. Black folks don't want no responsibility. Because with responsibility comes what? Accountability. See, if you make me responsible to the collective, I now have to be accountable to the collective. So accountability and responsibility go hand in hand. I don't want to admit black people can fix their problems because if I admit that, that means I got to play a role in it. So I'm going to say it's nothing we want to do. I'm going to say it's nothing we can do. Negro don't want no responsibility or accountability. And that's why they will beat down the ones who bring the knowledge. They will beat down the ones who bring the wisdom. My detractors, one of the reasons they hate me is I make them responsible and accountable. When I say ADHD is a joke, it ain't nothing wrong with your child 
but you? They don't want to hear that. They don't need to be a specialist for no reading disability. He ain't got no reading disability. He got a lazy disability. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear me saying you spending $9 billion on weed every year when you can be building schools for your daughters. Black men spending $4 billion a year on alcohol, $2 billion on Air Jordan, but your sons ain't got no school. They don't want to hear that. With responsibility comes accountability. And that's why black people love, they love not to kill the oppressor. They love to kill the messenger. Wow. Well, do you, let me ask you this, because we often talk on media. We talk about, uh, we talk about fatherless homes. We talk about single motherhood, unmarried mothers. What do you think the answer is to that, doctor? What's the solution? Most of our problems will have bacteria. And the solution will likewise be multimodal. And so when we deal with this male-female relationship debacle, it has several aspects and elements that must all be addressed. So you get some Negroes who will swoop in and say, well, if we just all became spiritual, that will solve our problems. That's a part of it, but that ain't going to solve it all because you ain't dealing with the economics of it. See, black people were married up until 1970. Oh, yes, we were. Slavery did not destroy the black family. We were married through slavery, we risked our lives to get married in slavery. We were married on Reconstruction, Trim Crow, Civil Rights, Black Power. We were married. You start to see the decline in the 1970s. Why is that? Because in the 1970s, the United States government decided to make the Black man economically irrelevant to the Black woman. Let me say that one more time. For my feminist sisters who are listening, your government because you're an American, and the government intentionally set out to make the black man economically irrelevant to the black people. They did this with unemployment, joblessness, and mass incarceration. That's when you start seeing the decline of the parented black family when the black man can no longer care for that family. He cannot separate the economic. I tell black women it's all the time. Most brothers don't want to get married. They can't do that. No, 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 no finance, no romance. No romance without the finance. Everybody knows that. But we don't want to talk about that. We want to reduce this to irresponsible black males. And then there's another issue you got to deal with. You got to deal with the educated, economically sophisticated, professional black women many of whom have been taught and indoctrinated to believe that the black man isn't worth anything. They have no respect for the black man. I'm not saying all the professional black women are this way. I'm not saying that. I'm saying enough of them are to make this. So you got women who are emasculating black men on the regular by constantly reminding them how they make more money than them and got more education than them and all this other crap. And then they say the black man can't stand a strong black woman. Well, some men can't stand a strong black woman. Sisters are correct. Yes, sisters are correct sometimes. But then other times, it's not the man who can't stand a strong black woman. It's the man whose woman wants to compete with him and emasculate him and denigrate because she earns more and has more education. So it's not the woman who's the victim all the time and the man who's the perpetrator. Men are as much perpetrators as they are victims. I'll give you another example. I'm running into a lot of young black men on college campus who are telling me, Dr. And I'm having young black men tell me I'm not having no kids. Children. And I say, wow, why does all these beautiful black sisters out here? They say, Dr. Umar, we hear you. 
We need to save the family. We need to marry our women to come. I got an uncle. I got a father. I got a mentor. Who has children who can't even see his kids because she won't let them. Or is in and out of jail for child support because she's trying to make him suffer because the relationship didn't work out. So there's a lot going on in the black home. And I think it gets oversimplified because we don't want to deal with all the evils that take place. We don't want to deal with the domestic violence, black men beating on black women. We don't want to deal with black women psychologically emasculating black men. We don't want to deal with black women who can't stand a strong black man because she's supposed to run her men and tell them where to go. And we do got black men who can't take an educated, intelligent black woman. So there's all kinds of issues. And the problem is we don't lay them all out on the table. We're going to run to one thing. Brothers ain't responsive. Sisters are too hard-headed. You know, we want to find one thing and say the whole relationship, the debacle hinges on that one thing. No, not at all. It's multimodal. It's multifactorial. And I would add to that one of the biggest reasons why black men relationships are not working out because we are totally Europeanized intellectual. We are totally Europeanized intellectual. And so we don't approach marriage from how can I build with you? We approach marriage from what can I get from you and what can you do for me? Totally Europeanized. What can I get from you and what can you do for me? What I can do for you never comes into the equation. Selfishness. Selfishness is at the heart of the failure of European marriages, and because we do what other white folks do, it only naturally follows that selfishness is at the heart of why black families are failing as well. So, who do you think would need Dr. Johnson? Who do you think would need your your academy more? Do you think it would be the the children who have the the quote unquote nuclear family, mother, father, children, or would it be the children being raised in single mother homes? Who who would need to be who should be the first people signed up at FDMG? All of them. <laughs> All of them. Problem children versus the academically excelled children. So people were saying that you could take the problem kids because they needed more. And I disagreed. I said the problem kids needed, and the straight A and B kids needed too. And they said, why do the straight A and B kids need it? I said, because if we don't teach them to be more the black folk, those straight A and B kids will be the next Barack Obama. They will be the next Michelle Obama. They will be the next Condoleezza Rice. They would be the next Deion Sanders and Shaquille O'Neal and Ray Lewis and Jalen Rose and Stephen A. Smith. They would be the next Clarence Thomas. This is exactly who they'll be if we don't get them. So every child, whether their parents are both multi-millionaires or whether their parents are both living in poverty, every child needs the FDMG experience. Wow. Well, I never thought that we would, well, I thought that when I was younger, I thought there were, at some point, at least when I got into be like my 30s or 40s, there would be more black, because you know, you have the HBCUs, but you don't have that many. I mean, you have a few coming in, but you know, you don't have a lot of of schools for younger black children that are qualified. The ones that are full of black children, because um, I've, I've been in some of these schools in New York City and, and some of the schools down here in the South, the primarily black schools, the buildings are falling apart. They have raggedy desks. The books are falling apart. And even now, um, recently, there's lead in the water system. I mean, there's literally lead in the water system of these schools. Um and it's only it's pretty much in the schools where there's where everybody's uh, uh, black and brown. 
So we, we already know that. I thought by now it would be different. Um, I don't know if it was naivete or, or hope, but I thought it would be different, but it, it just seems the same, doctor. Post-traumatic slavery disease. Post-traumatic slavery disease. Black people are, are, they are, if you look at the list of priorities, black folks, any black person, nine times up, black success and black excellence is at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay, at the top, materialistic things, cars, clothes, modern types of things, social networks, getting married basically exploiting somebody for personal gain because that's what marriage has become. Marriage has functionally become in the United States of America the exploitation of another person for your personal gain. That's what it is. And then divorce happens when the person being exploited gets tired. And oftentimes both parties are exploiting each other so they decide to get a divorce together. They mutually split because <laughs> I'm tired of you using me and you tired of me using you. But getting back to the question, we are not our own priority. And we're the only people who are not our own priority. Latino, best interest of the Latino community is their priority. European Jews, best interest of the European Jewish community. Look at every group in this country. All you see them about is themselves. Not black folks. Jesus comes first, Muhammad comes first, being Hebrew is first, religions are first. I see Negroes being a Mason is the most important thing in their life. Their fraternity is the most important thing in their life. Black folk ain't number one. And that's why we need FDMG. Because FDMG has to teach our children that nothing is more important than your African racial family. Nothing. No organization, no religion, no nothing. As Garvey said, put the race first. That the Jew is always and foremost a Jew. The Chinaman is always and foremost a Chinaman. Everybody, foremost of themselves and for themselves. And if we want to catch up to them, we got to be for ourselves of ourselves. It's the only thing that's going to fix this. Until Africans make being African a priority, it never will be. Which is ironic because we want the United States government to pay attention to us all day long. We stay going to the government. Why would the government make you a priority in their life when you're not a priority in your own life? You, your own people are not even priorities. But you want the government to be a priority. See, there's a big contradiction in our tug of war with the U.S. government because we want the government to do things for us we won't even do for ourselves. Look at the irony in that. Isn't that ironic? We want the government to give us better schools but we won't build none for ourselves. We want the government to stop its police from killing us but we won't stop killing each other. We want the government to practice justice with black folks but black folks don't practice justice with each other. If you have a problem with another black person if you have been treated unjustly in some way by another black person, who can you go to in the black community to have that, pe have that person dealt with or have that conflict resolved? Nobody. Nobody. There's not a single entity in the black community that will help. If you stole from me, I got to go to the white man to get my money back. That's a damn shame. I can live in a community with a million blacks. Philadelphia, a million blacks. Chicago, several million blacks. New York, multi-million blacks. But guess what? If somebody steals from you, there's no black organization you can go to. You got to go to the white man to get your money back. You got to take them to court. That's a damn shame. And you know what that speaks of? That speaks of us having no infrastructure. The black community has no systems. It has no processes. There are no checks and balances. It has no infrastructure. And guess what? We don't want none. Because with infrastructure comes responsibility and accountability. And the last thing a black person wants to have to do 
is account to another black person. We ain't got a problem accounting to white folks. We think they're God anyway. But don't tell me I have to answer to another black person because I cannot do that. I have been taught that black people ain't ish. And if I have to account to another black person, then that means I'm even lower than them. And unfortunately, that's how our people think. And that's why they hate each other. And that's why it's hard for black people to supervise other black people on the job because we have been conditioned to hate black folks as much as white people do. Hmm. Well, I often say, and I say it a lot, at least <laughs> a couple times a month on these streams, I say a lot of us, we just love white folks. We just love them to death. I mean, am I wrong? For, am I wrong for saying that, doctor? Brother, we love white folks, brother. We love them. Listen, the best observation you can do, and as a psychologist, we're trained to observe. The best observation you can do or make is to watch black people around white folks. It is the most enlightening thing to see. When we get around white folks, we transform. We wasn't smiling, we start smiling. We wasn't conversating, we was conversating. It's like you see a black woman get a compliment from a black man, she just looked at him like he just wants some butt. Let that white man compliment the black woman. He might want nothing but some butt either. But because he was white, she will smile at him. Oh, thank you so very much. She will light up with joy because of cracking it. That's us, brother. We will change our voice. We will change our talk. We will change our stance. We will change our clothes. Let me see a, a black person move into a white neighborhood. They act totally different in the white neighborhood. Totally a whole different energy, conversation, tone, voice. And then soon they walk back to the hood, they go right back to being with it. We love white folks so much that we will be whatever they want us to be just to gain their acceptance. And then Negroes will come up with lies. I didn't move to the suburbs because I love white folks. I moved to the suburbs to give my kids a better education. Well, if you wanted to give your kids a better education, why didn't you build a school in the ghetto and give them a better education? You ain't have to go put them in a class full of Europeans. Why you marry that white girl? Because I grew up with nothing but white girls, and that's all I had around me. It's a damn lie. We all grew up with white girls. I ain't never had one. We make excuses because we don't want to admit that we are in love with white folks, and we can't live without them. I'm telling you that if white folks gave black people a couple states in this country, which some black organizations want, which to me is ridiculous because now you're landlocked by your enemy militaristically, that's the worst thing you can do. But anyway, we love white folks, so they want some states with the white men. They don't want to go to a country they only want to be with a white man. They call it nationalism, but it's really immigration. So let's say that they get a couple states, and you got all black states. Guess what would happen? I promise you, black people would go and get white folks and put them back in charge of black folks. That's how much we love them. If white folks left, we would go get them. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being honest. We would go get them and bring them back and put them back in power. That is how much they have conditioned us to believe that they are God. Wow. I mean, it's uh, it's it's actually sad, man, that we have to, I don't know, we have to resort to kissing white folks' butts just to feel like somebody. And meanwhile, all we have a tendency to do is tear other black folks down. I mean, you 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 see this so much, doctor. I mean, you you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. The things that I've seen people do, uh, not just to me, but to other black folks, they wouldn't dare do it to white people. They wouldn't dare say it. They wouldn't dare attempt it. They they wouldn't dare. But for some reason, boy, they can sure manage to do it over and over to black folks. And that in itself to me is, is, is sad in itself because if you can muster up the courage to... Uh, to degrade and downtrodden and shame black folks. Why you're not out there doing it to, 
to white people. That's what I want to know. Why you're not out there doing it to them? Black people are white. That's why the Obama presidency was the worst thing that could have happened to us. Because when you have a people hell-bent on being accepted by their oppressor, and then you symbolically give them a member of their community who was accepted by the oppressor, it automatically sends them into fanciful, imaginary dreams of what could be. Those eight years, we fantasize about how Obama is opening up the door for all of us to renegotiate our relationship with white power. That's what Obama represented. He represented a renegotiation of the black condition with the white power structure. That's what he represented. And the irony of it was while white folks were thinking Obama represented a renegotiation with white power, what did white power do? They were also renegotiating their relationship with black folks by doing what? Going out of their way to let Negroes know that this is not no renegotiation, but this is a reminding of who you are to us. And while he was president, you saw one of the worst ways of police violence you ever seen in your life. Some of the highest black unemployment you ever seen in your life. White folks had a party with Obama. Who they had a party? Because think about it. The president is black and he's a coward. He's not going to say nothing to white folks about what we do to black folks for eight years. We can hide behind this black man and do whatever the hell we want to do with the black folks because he ain't going to do nothing about it. They were going to court TV and let Obama destroy his reputation with black folks. When that Michael Brown thing went down and he saw that Barack Obama was threatening them to pop the check and get it into my kids with their investigation. And let that grand jury not find that damn devil guilty. And he says, You want me to stay here and co sign this shit? Oh, no. It's like, let's hold the resign, man. He saw that his president was prepared to digest the black, and his statements were not tolerated. And I respect him for that. I respect him for that. I respect him for this. Because it was so much of an honorary title, attorney general, that's a major position. You are the top lawyer in the country. That is major. The average speaker would have would have passed in the sunlight with that job. And attorney general holding his speaker for it. He had enough guts. But you know what? I'm not gonna be a party of this. I'm gonna leave before my turn is even done. So get the election. I'm out now. I respect him for that. But Barack Obama took Negro and got his shit. Negro still didn't even recognize what he did. He homosexualized our boy. I mean, he's homosexual. You realize before he was president, he did not have his homosexual family on the street. They put him in office to push that way of life on our people. Do you think? Do you think it's going to be another black president, Dr. Umar? Ever? Yes. It has to be. Because it was too good. Look at what they were able to do. This is going to be another black president. White people don't know what he is doing. Think about this. If, if Obama was white, do you think black people would have accepted homosexuality the way they did? And Jewish Bush would have told black people that they're going to teach gay studies in the class. And we won't let boys go into the girls' bathroom and let girls go into the boys' bathroom. And we're going to use homosexuality to block out the gays and block the gender. And then we ain't going to talk about black issues. We ain't going to talk about gay issues. If George Bush would have done that, he would have done that. would have done Only a black person would have got that chance. If the police was killing black folks the way they were killing black folks all the time, George Bush, the Ronald Reagan black folks would have went off 
He would have been a Rodney King every day, but because the president was black, and we cared more about him than our own kids. Yes, you will get another black president. You have to. Because what they did to Negroes during those eight years of Obamaism is an absolute mess. We sat still and fingered our hands and let white folks put us back and damn their slavery just so one thing could have a peaceful president. Yes, you will get another black president. Well, yeah, you're getting another one. Wow. Wow. Well, I want to, I know I don't want to. I don't want to keep you too long, Doc, but uh, I also, I want to thank you for coming on, man. It's been a while. It's been like three years, Doc, since we chopped it up. It's, it's been a few. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me quickly, if I can. Go ahead. Let me go ahead. do a rundown of the other speaking events, if you don't mind, Brian. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doc. So I'll be in Yonkers, New York for the first time, September the 28th. Yonkers, New York. I'll be receiving an award, and I'll be keynoting an awards gala. If anyone's interested in attending, it is a black tie affair for the Prince of Pan-Africanism. We'll be putting on the tuxedo on the first time in 20 years, but there's Yonkers, New York, September the 28th. And then I'll be in Birmingham, England, October 27th. London, England, October the 3rd. The possibility of Charlotte, North Carolina, and Chicago, Illinois, 13th and 20th of October, I repeat, the possibility of Chicago, Illinois, and Charlotte, North Carolina, the 13th and 20th of October, 27th, Birmingham, England, November 3rd, Lundy, England, November the 10th, Wilmington, North Carolina, November 11th, Nat Turner Land, Virginia. Nat Turner was killed on 11-11, so we celebrate him and all of our revolutionary ancestors on that Turner Land on November the 11th. I will be in the Gambia for the first time, West Africa, the Gambia, November the 21st to the 27th. Jamaica, New York, December the 2nd, Jamaica, New York. Detroit, Maine Public Library, December the 8th. Detroit, Maine Public Library, December the 8th. Ellaville, Virginia, December the 20th. Atlanta, Georgia, December the 22nd. Dallas, Texas, December the 3rd. Brooklyn, New York, December the 31st, Philadelphia, January the 6th, Chattanooga, Tennessee for Dr. King on January the 18th, Dallas, Virginia, January the 20th, and then I'll be marrying my good brother Stanley, and I'll be marrying my good sister Montrese, and then I'll be in Monrovia, Liberia in August. Don't forget, we got two trips to Africa in 2019. We'll be going to Ghana and the Ivory Coast in March, and we'll be going to Senegal in Ghana the last week of July, first week in August. Also, allow me to let your listeners know the Black Parent Teleconference. The Black Parent Teleconference is every Sunday now, not Tuesday, Sunday, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. every Sunday. Free answers to your questions about black child education and mental health. Phone number to the Sunday morning, 7 a.m. call. Every Sunday, 7 a.m., 857-232-0158, 857-232-0158. And the access code is 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND. Email me, Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. Text me, 215-989. Nine eight five eight. Support FDMG, and we soon shall be free. Well, once again, I was um, am honored as always. Uh, hopefully, it's not another three, four years before I get a chance to chop it up with you, Doc. Um, you said you're coming down here to the Queen City soon, right? Yes, sir. There's a possibility I'll be down there the thirteenth of. 20th of next month. All right. Well, keep us posted because you know we want to come down there with all our camera equipment and get an interview and all of that kind of stuff. Oh, no doubt. And don't forget, I might even need y'all to help me do some of these uh, video interviews, brother, for the shockumentary documentary, War Against Black Boys. 
Oh, absolutely. You because you know we fully stock when it comes to camera equipment. So I mean, all you gotta do is hit me up. You got my phone number. <laughs> I need to come down for a week. We go across the whole state and interview all the parents who volunteered, who got testimonials about what they've been through with their kids, trying to save them from the school system and the mental health system. So I'm going to definitely keep you posted on that. But for everybody listening, if you do have a testimonial that you want to offer on camera for the documentary, the psychoacademic Holocaust, if you got a story about immunization or medications, special education, autism, learning disability, uh, bullying, grades, being left back, not being taught, racism in the classroom, any story that you're willing to tell on camera, please text me your name, your city, your state, in the word shockumentary to 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. We are beginning shooting next month. The documentary coming. Okay. Yeah. Um, like I said, I mean, just let me know. Whatever you need, Doc, just hit us up. You know, we'll be there. <laughs> we'll yes, be sir. there. We will be there. And once again, I want to I wanna thank you, Dr. Umar. I mean, I know you're a busy brother, and you took the time out. And I don't know what part of the country you're in right now, but I know that you've been doing a lot. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time, you know, you to talking to us and, you know, dropping some nuggets nuggets on us. And hopefully, brothers and sisters, learn something from it. Hopefully. Indeed. So I'm going to say peace and uh, hit us up. Hit us up next month, Doc. We're going to come. We come. You know we're coming if you call us. Oh, no doubt. I got you. All right. Peace, my brother. Thank you. We might knock out a few interviews while we're down there. Yes, man. Yes, yes. You already know. You know when you told me to come to Rock Hill, I was there. <laughs> so, they don't even hesitate, man, to hit my digits, Doc. All right? You got them. Definitely. All right. Peace, my brother. All right. So we just got off the phone with uh, Dr. Umar Johnson. Uh, me and him, we have somewhat of a rapport, you know, me and the doc, we, we talk, you know, we, we shoot the shit back and forth. You know, I've had a somewhat of a relationship with the doc for about three, four years, you know, even though, you know, people think, you know, that TPOT is this little small insignificant thing. I mean, I actually know a lot of people that other people don't. And those are the facts. Even though this is the quote unquote, what do they call it? The Chitlin circuit. <laughs> this may be the fucking Chitlin circuit, but you take a look in my archives. I got people on my damn show that wouldn't set fucking foot anywhere near any of these other niggas platforms. Think about that. Chitlin circuit. <laughs> you dudes are funny. You trolls are even funnier. You're funny. I can't believe people will sit back and take the time and just create account after account after account when you got a brother like Dr. Umar on the line talking real shit. People are so uh, twisted up in their nonsense that they just keep making accounts, making accounts, making accounts, just trolling, doing exactly what the brother was talking about. Just fucking with black folks, fucking with black folks. I bet you won't do that shit to the white folks. I bet you won't do that shit to the white folks. You'll sit here and fuck with me all night while I'm trying to talk to Dr. Umar. I guarantee you, you won't go to those white boy shit and do it. You know why? Because you're scared of white folks. You love white folks. You're afraid of them. But you'll sit over here and fuck with somebody that look just like you. These are the type of people we have. This, this is what we have, man. You fucking people embarrass me. I'm embarrassed by you. To have somebody like Dr. Umar up here. And I got fucking people in the damn chat. Forget having respect for me. Having respect for that brother. They didn't even have enough respect for, for him. To fucking control themselves. They didn't even have enough respect for him. That's what bothers me. I don't give a shit what you say about me because they ain't like you motherfuckers stepping up and coming here. 
You ain't stepping to me. You ain't going to do nothing to me except what you're doing, creating accounts and name calling. That's all you're going to do. But at the very least, you should have had respect for the brother. If nothing else, forget about me. I can take your bullshit internet insults. I can take them all day long. I'm not thin skinned. I'm not small minded like you fucking people. But at least have respect for the brother. Couldn't even do that. They couldn't even do that. And they wonder. They wonder why shit is the way it is. Now, I want to thank the people in my chat room who have coof and control and dignity and integrity who asked intelligent questions and conducted themselves like adult human beings. You brothers and sisters, I respect. The rest of you, y'all ain't shit. Don't get mad at me because I can get people like Dr. Umar up on my shit. Don't get mad at me. I know Dr. Umar. I've dealt with him before. These are the type of people that I know. Because I'm not like you. I have respect for people, dignity for people, okay? Even with all the technical snafus, he still stayed. You know why? Because, see, he knows me outside of YouTube. It's not no YouTube relationship. I've met with that man, sat with that man, interviewed that man, talked with that man, shook his hand, shot the shit with him. Laughed at white folks with him. We've done that together. It's not no YouTube relationship like you fools have with everybody. That man knows me outside of YouTube, offline. He's got my phone number, my personal phone number, and I have his. How you think I was able to get him on the show? Bet you can't get him on yours. You get Dr. Umar on your show, I'll send you a damn stack. I'll wire you a stack. You can get him on your show. You ain't got enough damn sense to get him on your show. You ain't got enough integrity to get him on your show. Because you are the type of people who will sit out in this audience and disrespect not just me, but him too. What does that look like? What does that look like, man? Does that really make you feel better to get up here and not even have enough respect for a guest who took his time out to talk to you people? Because, see, me and Dr. Umar, we could have just had a phone conversation like we had today. We've been talking for the last couple of days. I didn't have to bring him to you. I could have just sat here and had a conversation with him by myself. That's it. I've been talking to the, how many days me and the doc been talking? Like over a course of four or five days, we've been talking practically every day. Because he knew he was coming on here tonight. He was actually supposed to come hit me up last week, but he had to fly out somewhere. He's a busy man. So I said, okay, I'll schedule it for next week, you know, and I'll have a conversation with you and, you know, sh- take a few questions, talk to a few brothers, you know, field a few questions, you know, that type of thing. And what the hell do some of you do? You get right in the damn chat room and try to embarrass me. But that's fine. That's fine. Because all you did is showed who you are, man. That's what y'all always do. Y'all always show who you are, man. Y'all always show show who you are. Y'all always do that. Always do that. Now, don't get me wrong. I got to apologize. There was a lot of technical nonsense going on. Shit was messing up, cutting off, all kinds of nonsense. But like I said, I know Dr. Umar. So he was willing to wait until I got it right. That man has more integrity. He has more style. He has more honor than a lot of you have. 
instead of controlling yourself for one night while I talk to somebody who many of you can't even hold a damn candle to. Just couldn't manage to do it, could you? Like I said before, you people embarrass me. You embarrass me. You do. And you embarrass yourselves. But to my brothers and sisters who, like I said, shot some questions and, you know, conducted themselves like decent black folks, I salute you. I do. I definitely want to thank you for shooting the questions at them. I definitely want to thank you for that. But the rest of you, you clowns and internet freaking <laughs> internet uh, roasters, you know, the only thing your damn ass is probably good at. I don't have any respect for you. None. None whatsoever. I have no respect for y'all. None whatsoever. And no one else should either. No one else should either. He was willing to stay the whole time, so he did. You know, that's how it is, you know, when you know people, you know, outside of YouTube. <laughs> that's how it goes when you really know someone, you know. That's how it really goes. But uh, once yeah. again, I want to thank y'all for coming out. My moderators, I want to thank you uh, for doing what you got to do in the chat. But y'all was a little slow on the draw tonight, all right? Y'all know y'all supposed to be cutting heads off when they say something stupid, especially when I get a guest. When I have a brother like Umar in here, y'all got to be on y'all job. Y'all can't let these clowns ruin it for the people who are here to listen to the lesson. Y'all cannot let them do that. Y'all cannot. All right. I'm in, I'm in the process of cleaning, cleaning the house anyway. Okay. I'm in the process of cleaning the house. I've been taking wrenches from people in the whole night. So, I mean, if you ain't willing to be a moderator, I mean, shoot me an email and let me know so I can just take your wrench. Because the only moderators I want is moderators that's quick on the draw. Especially when I got somebody like Dr. Umar Johnson in the house. I can't, I can't have people in here getting five and six lines of dumb nonsense ran through when I got a brother like that on. Y'all got to understand what I'm saying. So, I mean, if you ain't willing to get on your moderator job, just let me know. All right. Just let me know because I'll just take your wrench. Because like I said, I'm in the process of cleaning house anyway. OK, I'm in the process of cleaning house. So if you don't want your wrench, just let me know. That's all. Just come to me and say, hey, look, I don't want to moderate for you. No more X. And I'll oblige. I'll go into my settings and I'll remove it. That's it. It's as simple as that. I mean, we ain't, we ain't going to be playing them stupid games over here. Not anymore. That stuff is over. It's over. I say again, when I have guests like that on, y'all got to be quicker on the draw. That's all. This isn't a reprimand. This is a review. That's all it is. That's all it is. That is all it is. So anyway, I want y'all to think about what the brother said tonight. Because a lot of the shit that we do to each other, we would never, we would never, ever, ever do it to white folks. We would never do it to white folks. Never. So, I mean, we got to we gotta get right, man. We got to get right. Y'all going to see some, like I said, y'all going to see some changes on this channel, man. This channel is going to be different. All right? It's going to be different. And if you want to be part of this damn channel, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to adjust to some of the differences. All right? You're going to have to adjust to some of the differences because it's going to be different. It's going in a new direction. And we ain't putting up no bullshit. We clear? Good. So, with that, I will leave you with three words. Like I always do. Open your minds, and we are out of here, y'all. Open your mind.
of Thought series. Only from TPOT Media. Open your